At all three funding agencies, grant review procedures appear to allow and in some sense encourage politically based biases. Every year, the Canadian government gives out billions of taxpayer dollars to university professors to conduct scientific research. The justification for this immense expense is that such research will be of value to society, whether to create new knowledge, develop better medical treatments or social programs, produce new tech innovations, create jobs or boost the economy. For example, the mission of Canada's Medical Research Funding Agency, CIHR, is to create new scientific knowledge and to enable its translation into improved health, more effective health services and products, and a strengthened Canadian healthcare system. Unfortunately, it appears that various kinds of mismanagement is occurring at all three of Canada's funding agencies, which is impeding their ability to fulfill their respective missions. And we're talking about lots of money. Annually, Canada's three funding agencies spend a total of about $2.3 billion on research grants, in addition to over $100 million to operate the three agencies and all of their employees. We will present evidence that the funding agencies have mismanaged the research they funded but also that they've mismanaged how grant proposals were selected for funding. A brief note on how research grants are awarded by funding agencies. First, researchers submit grant proposals to funding agencies that describe what research will be done and why it's important. The agency then selects three to four other researchers to evaluate each proposal researchers who are supposed to have the relevant knowledge and expertise to assess the merit of the proposed research. The reviewers are supposed to read the proposals and then score each proposal in terms of its promise, rigor, quality, and the expertise of the team that would carry out the research if it was funded. So first, tri-councils have mismanaged funded research in various ways. They have not ensured that the funded research meets basic scientific standards, including open access and basic transparency. Tri-councils have not ensured that the funded research is actually publicly accessible to the scientific community and the broader general public. Tri-councils require open access, but they don't check compliance to this policy, nor do they do any audits. And we now know from meta-scientific evidence that open access compliance is fairly poor, for example, less than 40%. And indeed, we're way behind several European countries like the Netherlands, France, and Belgium who have successfully implemented open access laws since 2015 that mandate public open access of all publicly funded research. Second, Tri-councils also have not ensured that funded research meets basic transparency like data sharing and disclosing conflicts of interest and funding sources. Though again, they do recommend these things, but because they don't check, most researchers just don't comply. This means that the research they've funded is mostly not useful because there's typically not enough information to independently verify the correctness of the research or efficiently build upon or reuse the research. And indeed, we now know that most findings from published academic papers cannot be independently reproduced or replicated. But they've talked about it for years, even decades. But this is mostly big talk, no action, or empty promises. They've stalled for years on data sharing mandates for funded research, which they've been working on since the 1990s. More recently, they indefinitely postponed data management, data sharing policy, unreasonably blaming COVID-19. Even worse, after we pointed out the illogicality of postponing rather than prioritizing data sharing policy given the realities of COVID-19, we were repeatedly ignored. Another way the Tri-Councils have mismanaged funded research is that they've been too soft on fraud in the way they investigate research fraud. For instance, the names of Canadian-funded researchers convicted of scientific fraud are kept private due to privacy laws. This means that convicted research fraudsters can typically carry on with impunity by continuing with their industry-sponsored projects at private companies or by getting research jobs in other countries. Indeed, this is so bad that Canadian professor Amir Ataran has gone as far as saying that Canada might be the best place in the world to be a research fraudster. Such an opaque and secretive fraud investigation approach is embarrassing 
and is also discrepant from what's done in other countries. For example, the much stronger and more transparent name and shame approach used by the US Office of Research Integrity and in the Netherlands. A second kind of mismanagement by the tri-councils concerns the evaluation and selection of grant proposals which have been mismanaged in three ways. First, there is insufficient transparency in how grant proposals are peer-reviewed, scored, and selected. For example, the names of peer reviewers are kept secret and the actual content of the peer reviews are also not publicly released. This leads to poor quality reviews and it also means that reviewer biases and other conflicts of interest cannot be detected. Their process is also opaque given that no reviewer level evaluation scores are provided to grant applicants. This means it's impossible to independently verify that reviewer scores were aggregated correctly and that grant proposals were correctly ranked with respect to the funding thresholds. This opaqueness means that the agency is not accountable to errors made. We know errors will be made because grant reviewers are human, not paid, and are extremely busy people, so have very little time to carefully read proposals, score them, and provide feedback. Second, tri-councils have neglected and in some cases not fulfilled their basic duties. For example, grants have been selected without peer reviews returned. For some grant calls, peer reviews were not even provided to applicants, unreasonably blaming COVID-19 again. In fact, it's unclear if reviews were even completed or whether reviews were completed but just not compiled or shared with the grant applicants. They've also allowed unprofessional or incompetent reviewers, including sloppy peer reviews filled with incomprehensible sentences and typos. And worse, in one case, when applicants reported an incompetent reviewer to CIHR, the agency responded by saying the only thing they could do is to exclude that reviewer in future submissions, which is illogical and completely unacceptable. Tri-councils have also often been late by weeks on their own grant funding decision deadlines. And finally, tri-councils have allowed political and ideological values to unduly bias grant evaluation and selection in several ways. For example, all three tri-councils require applicants to include what's called an equity, diversity, and inclusion pledge, wherein applicants must demonstrate what they've done to promote EDI principles and what they'll do if they win the grant to further promote these EDI principles. And this problem appears to go even deeper in relation to what Dr. Gad Saad calls the indigenization of Canadian research, whereby researchers are forced to consider tribal ancestral knowledge as equal in merit to science, even though such traditional knowledge violates essential principles of the scientific method. Another problem involves politically biased grant evaluation criteria. A grant proposal is judged as being high quality only if it is consistent with politically progressive ideologies, even if a researcher personally disagrees with such values. For example, in the CIHR COVID-19 grant call, reviewers were instructed to score the quality of projects by considering the extent to which group-based identities like sexual orientation and religion were considered in all stages of the proposed research. Of course, group-based identities should sometimes be considered in research, for example, when examining medical treatment efficacy, but these considerations should be kept completely distinct from assessing the quality and rigor of a grant proposal. A final problem is that funding decisions are made by equalizing across the group-based identities of the grant applicants. This means, for example, that if 5% of grant proposals were submitted by francophone researchers, then 5% of research selected for funding must go to francophone researchers. Does it really make sense to decide what research or drug trials to fund based on immutable group characteristics of researchers, like the color of their skin or their genitalia? Of course not. And as eloquently said by Dr. Gad Saad, there's no greater cancer to individual dignity than giving a grant to someone based on their tribal identity rather than their individual merit as a scientist. It's grotesque. By equalizing grant funding decisions across groups, we may be unknowingly funding less promising research by less qualified researchers, depending on the average quality of proposals across all of the different possible groups. Never mind the illogicality and futility of this approach given the innumerable number of intersectional groups that exist. Independent of this, values related to group equity and outcomes are part of a so-called progressive political ideology, which many Canadians disagree with in favor of individual meritocracy. 
So this is particularly egregious given that government granting agencies and the public servants who work there are supposed to be politically neutral. In any event, it is self-evident that the evaluation of the rigor or quality of proposed research should not be based on political values. But in fact, at all three funding agencies, grant review procedures appear to allow, and in some cases even encourage, politically based biases. Strengthening our case is the United States Executive Order on Combating Race and Sex Stereotyping in the Federal Government which explicitly prohibits any government agency or federal contractor to use race or sex-based stereotyping in hiring or training. The order also prohibits the use of any divisive concepts like white guilt or white privilege, which by dividing individuals along immutable group-based characteristics promotes emotional tribalism and impedes individual meritocracy. In summary, it would appear that various kinds of mismanagement are in fact happening at each of Canada's funding agencies which impede their ability to achieve their respective missions. For CIHR, this hampers their mission of creating new scientific knowledge and improving the health of Canadians. Tri-Councils have mismanaged funded research by failing to ensure it meets basic scientific standards like transparency and by being overly soft on convicted research fraudsters. It has mismanaged the evaluation and selection of grant proposals by employing insufficiently transparent grant review processes, allowing political and ideological values to bias grant selection and have neglected other basic duties. In fact, these wrongdoings are so egregious that it appears they might even meet the degree of severity to be considered a serious breach or gross mismanagement under the Public Servants Disclosure Protection Act. And this mismanagement represents a lot more than just billions of dollars of wasted public money. We've potentially missed out on life-changing scientific breakthroughs and discoveries which could have prevented the deaths and suffering of millions of Canadians. We have emailed 17 senior executives at the three funding agencies to make them aware of our evidence of mismanagement but have not yet received any substantive response except a vague, we're looking into your request from a CIHR media relations person, we formally submitted a disclosure to the Office of the Public Sector Integrity Commissioner of Canada that summarizes our grounds and evidence of alleged gross mismanagement of public funds at the Tri-Councils. We'll keep you informed with any updates in a future video. Thank you. It's important that you, the taxpayer, engage with the videos to increase their visibility. So please like or dislike videos, leave a comment regarding points of clarification or other issues or topics you'd like us to cover. Leave comments pointing out any inaccuracies, mischaracterizations, errors. Finally, please consider making a donation so we can continue to create videos and achieve our goals of reforming research standards in academia. You can make a donation on our Patreon page, link to my left, or by making a one-time PayPal donation, link in the video description. Thank you.